That's a powerful mountain. That's the most probably religious of the most powerful mountain in this entire Rocky Mountain mountain range. And I mean from top to bottom. I'd say I was eight and I was taken to that mountain. I saw that mountain. I was there. And I was shown what the end of the earth would look like as we know it from that mountain. It scared me. And then all down through life, I've had every proof in the world that, that I ain't who I am. So it makes you think something's going on here. And my question has always been to Jack, where do you get these ideas? I mean, where are you reincarnated? Do you have dreams? So, I mean, it's almost like unnatural that a human being could have this knowledge and take that knowledge and turn it into something you can actually use. I try to find a word that might describe him. He's a stubborn old cuss is what he is. And sometimes I come up with primitive outdoor seagoing cowboy. He's just an old cowboy, you know? He's just an old, he's the Marlboro man. I'm the one to go When they say stop The one who questions everything Like is it real or not you know, uh, he's a good cowboy. He was, you know, he's an old time cowboy. A realist and a true mountain man. I'm not sure, but I believe my intuition's all I need. So someone whose goal is to go into an environment and survive with um, minimal or um, native materials. But I remember asking one time, says, you know, how'd you learn that stuff? You know, the, the, the uh, Native American tribes teach you how to do this? He said, well, actually, I teach them about their own crafts. I teach them about their history. And after being around him, I realized that that was really so. I know why I ain't like most. I feel like I've been here before. They rather think If the zombies take over and the apocalypse starts tomorrow, I'm going to find Jack Mackey because I know I'll have shelter, I know I'll have food and water, and I know I'll have a way to protect myself. My name is Jack Mackey, and I grew up in Valdosta, Georgia. He was adopted. My mother, my biological mother, took a center tail feather from a golden eagle and placed it in my adoption papers when I was adopted and told mother he'll know what it means one day. His biological parents, I think, did not have any intentions of having children. War was going on and so on, and so they apparently found a nice family uh, that wanted to adopt him. Winston Carlisle Mackey was my father and Dorothy Mae Jackson was my mother. And growing up, I, he had, uh, he always liked to play, you know, play cowboy. He dressed up and he liked to when I, go out and make a bow and, bow and arrow. Uh, I was making arrows when I was a little bitty guy. Walking around, we made our own bows out of cane and whatever. Uh, once in a while, we were lucky. Mama would go down and buy us one of those little bows from the 10 cent store and uh, we'd go up and down the creek shooting frogs. In North Carolina, that's when he made that birch bark canoe. I was, what, about eight or nine when I built my first birch bark canoe? When I think about it, I think about a gifted child growing up that was over overlooked. Where is it? Where does it come from? I have no idea. I don't know how I know how to do anything I do. All I know is I can do it. It's, it's all up here. I knew what the materials were, knew what they had to be, and I knew how to make them. 
Maybe I had some kind of help from somewhere else. Maybe somebody was standing over my shoulder somewhere. I don't know. All I know is everything has been that way ever since. I had some things take place that uh, could really spook you as a kid. Let me see how it all started. I was in my bedroom. Mother had a picture on the wall. It was a picture of Jesus with his hands on a young boy's shoulder. And she had that hanging in my room and I found myself standing in front of it. I felt a pressure behind me on my right side. And uh, all of a sudden, I was beginning to see a picture of a place that I'd never seen before. And I could look out across a group of mountains and I could see the Pacific Ocean. And I knew that's what it was. In a while, there was a tremendous blast. And that blast created a heat wave that came and I could feel it, physically feel it. And then I began to feel my flesh melt off my bones. And wherever it was behind me, I could feel his hand on my shoulder. He said, don't worry, you're with us now. But what you have seen is the end of time as you know it. And uh, it, then it all just sort of went away. But I knew right then and there that from that point on, I'd be protected. And I have been all my life. His adopted dad, Winston Carlisle Mackey, passed away when Jack was only 10 or 11 years old. My mother told me she was trying to get out of the woods, you know, and uh, she sold all the property that daddy had, and uh, she wanted to come into town. I said, I don't want to get out in the woods. And I think she gave him dancing lessons, ballroom dancing lessons, to try to change him or make a doctor or lawyer or something else that I think was expected of him to do. And I didn't want to be no doctor, didn't want to be no lawyer, you know. I didn't want to walk around with my loincloth around my neck like most of these people do. And uh, I just wasn't interested in it. That's not where my heart was. He just liked to be outdoors. He liked to be around horses. He liked to be in the woods. And I had five years, you know, high school and first year of college in a military school. And when I got out of that, uh, well, I actually went out west with Uncle Donnelly, uh, started working cattle out there. And his uncle had quite a big spread uh, down there. And I was breaking about 84 head of coats a year for him. And while I was there, uh, the Cuban crisis broke out. The United States answer to what Adlai Stevenson termed Soviet blackmail in Cuba was a quarantine of all offensive weapons being shipped from Russia to that island fortress. He was in the National Guard and he, he enjoyed it and got his honorable discharge. I didn't stay in the National Guard, but I had three years that I spent down in Central America. And we were after somebody down there and it took us three years to catch him, but we did. It's still classified today, so I can't talk about it. I came back to Valdosta the last year of the National Guard business or whatever it was. Uh, I came back here and uh, started hunting gators. It kind of started like I was in the swamp. And uh, I got to where I wouldn't use a gun to shoot alligators with. I'd kill them with an axe or I'd kill them with a lance. and. Uh, Sometimes you'd have to kind of improvise, you know. So how would you do it? You didn't have modern tools to do stuff with. So you'd have to think back, well, what did the old people do? How did they do it, you know? How would you catch a gator by George if you ain't got no hooks? Well, you'd have to use a throat gouge. So you'd, you know, cut a limb like that and tie a rope in the middle, bait it all up, hang it, let the gator come up and get it, he'd swallow it. When he started to swim off, it turned turn sideways and lock in his throat. If you needed something, and you didn't have it, you had to improvise to get it. And that's the kind of way things really, really came together. Mary Alice's first wife, uh, Jay's mother. I remember she was just one of the sweetest, just a very, very sweet, kind lady in every way.
one of my best memories I have of Jack, I guess I was probably maybe four, three or four, somewhere around there. Well, he used to take me down to Key West. Being so young, I don't have a vivid memory of it, but he used to take me out on a, on a boat. And it seems like one of the best memories I have is he and I being on a boat together and these three jets come flying over, you know. I met Jack in Valdosta, Georgia, when I was attending graduate school. I was working for the Planning Commission at the time. And uh, one day, Betty just come walking down the aisle with his little old short red thing on. Didn't look too shabby. Gorgeous set of legs on her. <laughs> I guess I could say our first date was a fishing trip. You know, she liked being outdoors and had a good time fishing. So that tickled me. He had a dory skiff, and so we went fishing off, uh, it was a little place called Spring Warrior, and it was just the neatest little place, I mean, miles off the coast, and it was still shallow, and you could see the bottom, and uh, anyway, we went out quite a ways, and all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, I need to be excused. <laughs> I got to go to the bathroom, and I think we're too far out to go back in, you're going to have to either pee over the side or pee in the boat, or I'll give you a bucket and I forgot to put the water in the bottom of the bucket. He handed me a five-gallon bucket, a plastic five-gallon bucket, and so I was trying to be as discreet as possible, and as soon as I relieved myself, there was just this noise like a drum, and I was so embarrassed. And I got to laughing. She got embarrassed, and <laughs> I told her, I said, if you're going to be around me, you're going to have to get used to stuff like that and not worry about it. <laughs> it's been that way ever since. He was witty and just full of a lot of things to do. I mean, you didn't get bored around Jack. I remember um, a couple of times that, that Jack and I had, had Jay with, with, with visitations. He was about four years old, I guess. He was up there trying to reach for something and then just looking at me. And I looked at him and he looked at me and Jay took off and I chased him out the front door and he ran under the car. It was so funny. And I could just see Jack doing that. The last time I saw Jack, I was at a babysitter. I can't remember if he picked me up and hugged me for the last time, set me down, walked out the door. It was the last time I seen him. When I left, it broke my heart. It pure broke my heart. I didn't know what else to do, but it was a decision I had to make. I wanted my boy alive. I wanted his mother alive. And I was afraid they wouldn't be by George if I stayed. I know that Jack felt he didn't want to hurt anybody, but as time went on, we had quite a few setbacks, and when he feel like reconnecting, something else was going on, or he would have a setback financially. My mother remarried a guy from Lake Park there, Ray Dowdy, and uh, Ray was a, a great father. You know, I couldn't ask for a better dad to raise me. In some of these situations, it's like somebody has to be the bad guy, and I guess he said, I'll be the bad guy. We never have a chance to get together. We, we just never had a chance to get together. As I recall, we were not present when an adoption took place. We were in Wyoming in a remote ranch with very few communications, and we may go to town once a month. I think we are born with a, uh, a need to create. If you believe in the Bible where it says, and God created man in his own image, if God was the master creator, created the earth, uh, the universe, the stars, the plants, everything around us, uh, if we're created in his image, wouldn't we want to do a little creation uh, as well? When we first went out west, um, we, were, we lived in Jackson Hole, and he was talking about building a horn bow. 
he always talked about, I want to make a horn bow. I want to make a horn bow. I had no idea what a horn bow was. Uh, he started gathering materials then when he would see an opportunity to do that. If uh, there was a, a problem animal, if, they, if there was a roadkill, if there was an animal that had to be put down, they would call Jack. Fishing game would call Jack. So I was getting, you know, materials for even Sinu and stuff. He uh, got a set of sheep horn that actually, it was Rocky Mountain sheep that came out of uh, New Mexico. And uh, they would give me sheep horn and moose antler and anything I needed, you know. He managed to salvage and use just about every every part of an animal. I even had that blame government giving me stuff. And that's when he made his first sheep horn bow. But when he started on it, it took him nine hours standing up, and he uh, he raised the temperature at about 109 degrees. And he stood, he was in there for nine hours sweating and working on this bow. And the reason he had the temperature so high was because of the glues that he worked with, so they wouldn't set up too fast. Oh, there are only a few or maybe a couple dozen that I know of that uh, actively will make a sheep horn bow. It's a real challenge. All I can say is, whew. That was their atomic bomb. They would not tell a white man about this bow at all. Uh, when you shoot it, it's like pulling a rubber band, but it shoots so fast uh, if you've ever shot one. It, it feels like you're pulling a rubber band back. When you let go, that arrow shoots out of there like a rocket. So it's a very advanced technology in, in archery. You know, I've hunted all my life. I guess I've killed just about everything on the North American continent. And uh, I've killed it all with a bow. A good friend of his was a mentor of mine, uh, Dr. Charles uh, Grayson. He went by Bert. Uh, he told me that Jack made a horn bow, and he hunted buffalo off of horseback with it, and he harvested four buffalo with only four shots from his horn bow. But uh, I would say seeing his talent and realizing that when he got into a lot of the naturalistic technology that he, that he does uh, was probably from the time he was around 40 to 44. I think a lot of the natives would be very envious and of, the, of, the, of his ability and the things he can do. I mean, he was always acknowledged as a, a, a real expert in all the, the archival kind of uh, uh, tools, you know, from oh, hundreds of years ago. And I don't know anybody else that can do that. I have no idea how he is that talented, but it has to be from some higher plane, I think. weapon, make a coup, and that would be done. He earned feather that day. Uh, probably one of the most important things they could do is take a man's weapon. Most of the time that we were out west, we were near Native Americans whether in Alaska or uh, in Idaho, around Nez Perce or in Montana. After Betty and I actually got married and we drove out there and we went into Browning, something made me go there. And I was coming down the highway from Cutbank, I looked up and there it was. And I knew immediately what that mountain was. You know, I said, Betty, there's Chief Mountain right there. I know it, I know that's the mountain. I knew as though it had just happened. That was a true vision quest, is all I know. I didn't know who these people were. I couldn't understand the language, but I understood exactly what they were saying. One of them guys, or whoever it was, put his hand on my shoulder. He says, you don't worry. You with us now. Now, he was standing right here. 
And the only other place in that same direction that I know about was a six car, which is the real word for Blackfeet. During the time we've been together, there's just been a lot of things that have happened that are just hard to explain. The book that, this, that, a, that a, an old man gave him when we were in Alaska entitled The Ghost Dance Religion. And uh, we looked in the index and I started looking at these names and there were names back there that were like Jack Winson or Jackson Winson, or very close to what his name is, Winston Jackson Mackey. And then I looked at the, looked next to that and said, names that Wavoka went by, and Wavoka was, you know, just, he, he started the ghost dance religion. A lot of these Indian women, everywhere I've been, among the Tlingit, Blackfeet, you're not from here, you're from someplace else. One of them looked at me one day and she said, Jack, she says, you are reincarnate of Wavoka. It just gives you chills, you know, when you think about something like that. And just uh, and some of his associations with native people when he was shooting his horn bow. It was a real cloudy day and the clouds parted back. We had an encampment on Cutbank Creek and uh, Cutbank Creek was coming straight out of the Rocky Mountains, right out of Glacier Park. Everybody had their teepees set up. All that crowd had a sweat going on sweat lodge built. It was a big one. We had a thunderstorm building back toward the mountains and I mean it was black and it was lightning in there like you wouldn't believe. I picked the bow up, took the first arrow and reared back and I fired that first arrow. And as I did so that storm came right to, to the point that it was in our face. And I mean it was terrible. That's the blackest cloud I've ever seen. Lightning as big as my leg. And uh, when I fired the last arrow, the storm stopped, started moving back. It split and moved back toward the mountains. When it got back toward the mountains, it was completely split. It turned and came back down on either side. And the sun was shining down on the camp and on us, on the sweat lodge. You ought to heard the mumbling going on, especially from the elders. And yeah, I was a teacher, I think, for 12 years, and then I was a, uh, a school counselor for maybe 25 plus years, something like that. When we lived in Cluckwine, I was a principal teacher, and uh, we built a boat in southeast Alaska, he and I, and it was part of a boat building class to show the high school shop class how to build a boat because that was their livelihood. That's what they did, they fished. And so we built a boat there, and he fished that. He would take people out. We were always around a native village, you know, and Jack was, you know, he was fishing. Dick Boris and I were fishing on Dick's boat, and one of our buddies was a native from Cluckwan, and he was in the next boat over by himself and had caught a whale, and that whale was having a fit. And uh, we, we said, geez, we need to go help him do whatever. So we cranked up and reeled our net in. As soon as we did, we started to pull over toward him, and he kept waving us back. But we came on in and pulled up to the side of him and tied our boat off to his boat, but he kept motioning us back. And he was sitting there talking to that whale. And he talked in a low, low, guttural voice, real low tone, you know, calling her mother, calling her grandmother. He reached down and pat that whale. I want you to lay still so I can cut this net off of you. And he did, and she did. He cut that net off of her in just a few minutes. He had it all off. She just raised those old flukes. I'll never forget it long as I live. She just raised those old flukes and just down she went, just gone. Most beautiful thing I ever saw in my life. The whole thing, the conversation he had with her, all of it. And I asked him, I said, how do how, how you learn to do something like this? He says, we do this all the time. And that was where it went. Well, it wasn't too long after that, I was hunting with Father Mike, and uh, he'd killed a deer, had that deer on his shoulders. We were walking out of the woods, and all of a sudden, we run smack into Brownie. And Brownie just sat there and looked, Father Mike stopped. Me, I was about to have a fit. I was kind of worried about that deal. That was a big brown bear. And uh, Father Mike just started talking to him. Grandfather, let me pass. My children are hungry. Please let us pass. We're not here to hurt you. Your children are hungry too, and I will share what I have with you. You go your way, let me go my way. I promise I'm not here to hurt you. I'm not here to hurt your family. 
Pretty soon, that old bear just sort of dropped down on all four feet and then looked off toward the woods, stepped off in the woods and just let us go by. Father Mike never looked back, never looked back. And I feel it behind him, I'm telling you what, I could have bred him, I was so close to him. <laughs> I talked to Austin Hammond about it. He showed it again, went through it again, and showed me, and explained to me in those same guttural low tones, he was talking to the bear, he was talking to me at the same time. And uh, was actually explaining, you know, what's going on here. I don't know, I guess after that, my experience with them, I've talked down, as far as I know, something like 22 bears. We were fixing to leave Alaska. After going through quite a bit, we lost a boat, a nice boat, and we lost the fishing season. I told Betty, I said, well, maybe it's time to go. So I loaded everything in that stock trailer. 33 years in the back of my truck. We were relocating to Idaho, and we were in a hurry because I had a job interview. And uh, so we went down there, you know, and that's when that complication took place. So we had all of our papers. When we crossed the border, we were asked the usual questions and everything, and Jack offered for the agents to, you know, hear him. He had bows behind the seat. And of course, Canadian Customs is actually environment, is run by Environment Canada, or either Environment Canada is run by the Revenue Department, okay? They ain't like us. It's all social, they ain't like us. There was a bear hide that was in my trailer, black bear hide, and it had fallen down by the door. And that's, that started it. And they saw that bear hide, then they like to had a fit. They just started tearing everything apart in that start trailer. Come to the truck, took my parka off my back, you know, took my moccasins, my mucklucks off my feet. Anyway, they ended up confiscating all of his, all of his work. 33 years of my work was in that. I had a 17-foot stock trailer, and it was loaded from floor to ceiling, side to side. Just everything I'd done, I spent a lifetime building it, making it, trying to learn from it. Uh, this was about a five-year case with uh, a U.S. Senator working on it and a law firm working on it pro bono. And they returned items that were like raw materials, including sheep horn, including some other things. But they kept a, most of the finished collection that he had made. And they did burn some things, including the eagle feather that was with his adoption papers. It tears you apart inside. It makes me think about some people in terms I didn't never like to think about. Yeah, I'd cut their throat. I'd do it in a flash. His, his health just really started deteriorate, deteriorating at that time, and I could see that. I mean, Jack, had, his health went steadily down after he had uh, a heart attack over all this. And it cut me in half. I'm half the man I ever was. There's a saying that knowledge is not the filling of a vessel, but the lighting of a fire. You can steal everything I got, and I'll go back and redo it. Whether I did or didn't want to, I always did what I had to do. Wake up in the morning and put on my shoe. It won't stop till the day is through. I always find a way to get the things I need. Cause sitting back and watching just ain't in me. You know what I mean. From sun up to the sun goes down, don't stop till the day is gone. I hope one day I can just sit back and be proud of the work I've done. A wise man said that you run the day or you let the day run you. I guess that's why I put in words like I got something to prove. That's why I can't stop.
The community of Orofino, Idaho is preparing to reenact the journey of Lewis and Clark on the Clearwater. She was doing the working on the canoe project in Idaho during the, the Ken Burns documentary. Well, we had that uh, bicentennial, you know, for Lewis and Clark. And uh, they wanted to make the trip from Orofino. They wanted to build the boats in the Orofino area, canoe camp area, and uh, come float the river, the same thing Lewis and Clark did. They wanted to just do that reenactment. We built 30 of them, uh, I guess from 17 feet to 30 feet long. We've always considered Plymouth Rock as the discovery of America. America wasn't discovered until Lewis and Clark got to Orfino, Idaho. That's when they realized we've got a whole country behind us and we've made it to the ocean. And when they got to uh, virtually Weite, the, the, upon the prairies, uh, on the Camas prairies at Weite, where they, where they met the Nez Perce for the first time, that was the discovery of America. That was America. That clinched it. We did it. He was doing a lot of presentations there for schools and for civic groups, and he was staying very busy with those things. My dad told me that a man works by the sweat of his brow. I didn't understand what he meant then, but I damn sure I do now. It ain't easy, and I can't bow to sit here and pretend. It's an honest cycle. You get back what you put I'll teach anybody I can. That's what I'm here for. That's what I gotta do. I'm a bridge between two cultures. Yes, it's soft and dry. He gave lectures all over the country about this kind of stuff. It wasn't, it was that uh, he hid it. I wish there were more people that had interest that wanna, young people that wanna learn it, live with it, you know, and uh, so they can carry it on. That's. Yeah, it's important stuff to uh, you keep your culture alive, keep your history alive. It's got to be put in people's hands, it's got to be told to them, and they've got to want to learn it. And you saw what a crowd we drew the last time. There's people there that want to learn, and they really do. I mean, he corresponded with uh, some, some of the people he knew with, uh, in uh, SPT, Society of Primitive Technology, and, and made some connections there. Yeah, I mean, I didn't start, it started me. So, I mean, that's always been part of my DNA. If you're a teacher, you're always thinking about creating somebody who's going to be your teacher now, who's going to do it better than you. <laughs> but I'd be teaching even if I didn't get taught. I, I think one reason I was put on earth was to learn and then transfer what I learned to other people. We all came from these. This is our uh, common ancestry. Uh, we all inherited it, this. And, and there's no bounds through, through race or color or creed. And uh, people that go to these primitive technology uh, skills and workshops and all, hopefully we're keeping it alive. It's not all going to be lost. Dad, where'd you Put your I mean, it's kind of been, my whole life story has been defined by being interested in primitive skills. And then when I started learning primitive skills, 
I was just instantly hooked. It was really like the moment I made a fire by friction and blew a tinder bundle into flame, there was nothing else that was as exciting for me anymore. When we turn on um, the skills, when, when it wakes up our minds and our bodies to do these things that we've evolved to do, it's incredibly empowering, um, it's exciting and inspiring. We all have a natural blueprint to connect with the natural world, right? We have our five physical senses and then our intuition that was honed over millions of years of living close to nature. We're wired to notice the sound of that bird over there, to feel that change in temperature. When you gather your set for your friction fire kit from that cottonwood tree over there or that juniper tree, you suddenly start to realize that you have a relationship with it. From parched deserts to damp rainforests, living in the most brutal landscapes on Earth takes a certain kind of human. That's where Hazen comes in. Primal Survivor continues. Wow, that got a little crazy. Fast. Mondays at 8 on National Geographic. Well, I'm Hazen Audell, and right now we're in our fifth season of a show called Primal Survivor. It basically it looks at how different indigenous people or traditional living people are living in really remote corners of the globe. And just looking at how they're living off the land, how they're raising their families out there, and um, which is my passion. Some people are born makers, and some people are, are just born with having an understanding of nature too. And with, like for Jack, for example, he's interested in nature and he's a maker at the same time. <laughs> Howdy. Hello. I'm Hazen. Hazen Jack Mackey. How are you doing, nice son? To, nice to if we do get that opportunity to meet somebody that's like a maker that's doing it and especially, you know, you see somebody like Jack and they're they're engulfed by their passion. And if you get a chance to meet hands on hands with somebody like Jack, you you can't help but to wonder like what is going on? What are, the, what are the gears twisting around that guy's head? You know, what makes him tick? I just do it. I'm told to do it, I think. I feel like I'm told to do it. And I won't argue with him. I'll do it. Well, come on in here. Let's see All if right. you, if you <laughs> want to. I don't look at myself as a survivalist or anything like that. Oh, yeah. um, but there's like, for me, my take on it is that I totally love nature. And I love participating in nature. I don't just want to see. Um, so, me being a survival guy, I'm just really handy. Up top there, that's actually a blowgun. Um, and that is a essential tool for survival for the, for, the people, for the group of people that I was living with, the Walranis. So I lived with them in my, when I was 19, in my early 20s. This is knowledge and skill that's been refined for generations and generations and generations. Lord have mercy, son. And that's a round bow, too. So that means the compressions and the tensions are balanced right down the very center of that bow. There ain't no wonder this bow works as good as it works. The deeper thinkers are like, God, you know, I really wish I would have listened to Grandma. Look at this. You know, because she knew how to do it really well. And all it takes is for all that knowledge and all that information that's been passed on for hundreds of generations. We're at these last two generations where none of that information is being passed. And so now we're, we're really lost. And the minute somebody goes from living off the land and, and being reliant on things that their mom make them, like this backpack, and then going into like the capitalistic society, it just takes one generation for all this knowledge of how to build things like this totally gone. Wow, that is nice. Now we've got kids out there, some young people that are beginning to learn how to do some of this. Well, you met some. They don't have to learn it all. Uh, even native people didn't know it all. That's a nice outfit. Somebody had, they did some thinking. They always had one person in a village that knew how to this do this thing. Another person knew how to do this thing well. And anytime something happened, these people would pop up and be there to show others how to do this and that when they needed it. And I guess they understood 
that's the way it was going to be because our people won't learn. Like, like our Western culture is really, you know, you could say it's a hundred years old. And we have this dominant force to like change cultures. These cultures that have basically kind of perfected themselves over thousands of years. And we're telling them that they're doing it wrong. Well, we can already tell right now that it's, we're living in a culture that's not sustainable. But they've been sustainable for thousands of years. They've had it figured out and they're content and happy. And you see that. This is a lifesaver. They live with the natural environment, whether it's a desert, whether it's tundra, whether it's coral reef or a jungle. And um, they know how to maximize everything out of their environment. And so they're makers. They have to be makers. Oh, Lord, Ryzen, you don't know how much I appreciate this. Yeah, well, me too. This makes my heart sore. It just does. <laughs>
It wasn't long after that, I, I told Betty I was having problems with my hands anyway. I was going to have to make a decision of some kind, I didn't know what. The winters are brutal there. He was getting to the point that he was about to lose his hands. So, uh, you know, we both, have, we both have family down here, and it was much warmer. <laughs> I told her, I said, pack up, let's go. And uh, we did, we packed up and we left the Northwest. And uh, we went back to, to the Southeast so, so I could see my boy, really. He's always wanted us to come to Montana. We've talked about it. You know, I got a phone call one day. Betty said, hey, they, you know, they want to take him out to Montana and shoot some of the stuff that he's been talking about and be where he was and experience what he experienced. And um, she said, but you know, he's, he's not in great health. And uh, I really don't want him to go without you. I knew I was going to have a hard time. Even before I went to the hospital, I knew I was going to have a hard time up here. I almost didn't come because of, because of my business. But Catherine is a nurse, and Jack is he's he's got you know he's got health issues, and he really needed a nurse here with him full time. The week before, Jack was in the hospital. I feel like I want to go home. His breathing was terrible. Um, of course, I'm sure that the, the, I'm sure they didn't want to let him out of the hospital. But with people like Jack, you don't really tell him what he's going to do, you know. And he meant he was coming. And he told us, you know, he said, I'm, I'm going with you kids one way or the other. We flew into Spokane, Washington, and we drove down to uh, a wee Ipe, Idaho. And after Jack came back from Alaska, that's the place they settled in at. Just to, to get to know Jack more and to see where I come from. I need to see where he's been, what he's done, meet some of the people that, that he's uh, uh, been in contact with. We actually stayed at the house that he lived in f from 2007 until 2011. And, uh, you know, you got to think, I, I had no idea where he was at. So it was, it was really interesting to actually stay in the house that he lived in through those years, because I can look back and see where I was at. We left We Ike and we came across the uh, the Rocky Mountains into uh, uh, Glacier, uh, East Glacier, Montana, and it, uh, it's stunning. Jack knows that this trip could be his last trip. Jack knows he could die on this mountain tonight. Jack's okay with that. Because this trip with us has meant a lot to him. Being able to show his son where he was, what he did, you know, experience the beauty of this place with him has meant more than anything. I think it has meant the world to him. And uh, I wanted him to see some of what I had kind of been through in a way. Chief Mountain I'm talking about primarily. I'd say I was eight and uh, I was taken to that mountain and it's as clear as I'm standing here right now. I was there. A lesson from it? Well, I can tell you this. You better take care of it you better take care of this earth. I know that much. You take care of the earth and it'll take care of you. My feet below Chief Mountain. You know, that's no that major. If I died today, just put me out there for the coyotes at the bottom of the mountain. Let the coyotes eat, you know? <laughs> Turn it into something good for nature. If he died today, his life is complete and he'd be happy with it. 
you know, for Jack, yes, this was this is Jack's last hoorah. It's a, it was a, you know, it was a chance to come to Montana and and uh, and spend some time with my father. And I'll be out here more. Now that he's shown shown me this, I'll be here with my son. So yeah, <laughs> it's meant a lot to me to watch Jay Hill and to watch um and to watch Jack fulfill what he wants to fulfill, you know, to show his boy where he was, you know, what he saw, what he experienced, what his life has been. That's, I mean, it's, it's what movies are made of. I look at it like this, and this is the reason why I'm so forgiving in life with people. You know, uh, you're put here to live your life, and you're put here for uh, whatever it is that the Creator has, you're put here for your purpose, whatever your purpose is. Well, you know, Jack served his purpose. Somebody you can look up to. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Something like that. Yeah, well, it, it flies <laughs> right. straighter than that. I tell him all the time, I said, you're 70% you're Mary Alice, which is his mama, and 30% Jack, you know? And that 30% kept you wondering, you know? As far as the eye can see, oh, oh, oh. when the going gets tough. When I was a child, I kind of idolized him because I had a lot of people through the years that, you know, oh, you're Jack Mackey's son. And uh, you know, old Jack, boy, he sure was a, you know, he was a, he was something yeah. else, you know. Boy, you'd love to, you'd love to know your dad. When the going gets tough. Hearing stories about him, everybody, no one had anything bad to say about Jack. I've never heard a bad word. I've never heard anybody say anything bad about Jack. Everybody loved Jack. Everybody needs a hero. That's why I put in words like I got something to prove. That's why I can't stop.